and uh, well, thank you for inviting me. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Um, and I think that what I'm going to try and do in the 20 minutes that I've been given is uh, to talk you through this project, the Open Library of Humanities, some of the backgrounds in open access debates um, around the sciences and humanities that I think are relevant to what we're trying to do. Um, but I think I'll also perhaps touch on some of the aspects that have been brought to our attention by our other speakers. Um, and I was delighted by Rosemary's talk about uh, the journal that you're setting up, so I think I have quite a few things to say to that as well. Okay, so just to introduce it then very briefly, I will talk at more length about the Open Library of Humanities at the end of the talk. I thought I could end on a kind of rousing note of optimism and join us and we're building something which, which might appeal to some of you. Um, but just from the outset, so that you have a sense of what the project is, Right now, um, it's a project to build uh, two things, essentially, to build a mega journal for the humanities, which means a very large scale open access journal uh, in the style of the Public Library of Science, or PLOS, which um, is very well established now, has, has been going since uh, about 2000. At the same time, we're also launching a monograph pilot scheme to see how we can cost um, the open access publication of monographs. We're working in partnership with four publishers, three of whom are very high profile university presses from different parts of the world, and one of whom is a born digital open access publisher. And the idea is that, um, as I think Rosemary touched upon, there are some concerns in the humanities communities about the legitimacy of open access online publications. So we're using the monograph project partly to try and get transparent costing figures, which are very hard at the moment to come by, as to how much it costs to produce an open access monograph. But also by working with high profile university presses, that gives us this kind of prestige that we really need to launch a project. At the same time, the business model that we're developing for the mega journal side, which is journal articles, can cross subsidise monographs. We all know that there's very little money to be found in funding monograph publishing, particularly open access. Um, so it's a sort of cross-subsidising model. I'll come on to that um, a little bit later on in the talk. Um, I was going to start then just um, to say a couple of things about open access, not too many, because we've had some definitions flying around. Um, but I did title my talk um, based on a quotation that came from the Budapest Open Access Initiative. And it was something that I think Stephen actually mentioned this idea that an old tradition and a new technology have converged to make possible an unprecedented public good. And, and Stephen went into some detail about the kind of 17th century origins of scholarly print publishing, a model that we still have today, which works on a kind of logic of exclusion where you only have a certain number of pages that you can publish. Therefore, it's very hard to get accepted into the, you know, the, the top level journals that were originally <coughs> representing the scholarly societies. Um, this old tradition, though, is also the tradition that academics don't need to get paid for their labour in terms of publishing journal articles, because by and large, and that's a contentious issue, I know, uh, we are you know, employed through the university system. So there's something distinctive about academics that is different from people making music or artists or, or writers, for example. So we have this kind of unprecedented opportunity to democratise scholarship now with the spread of the internet, with new software that's becoming available, with open source software. We heard a little bit about open journal systems, and I'll say some more about that in a moment. So it's, it's much cheaper, it's much easier, it's much more ubiquitous for us to actually be able to put our material online, and there are no limits. We can you know, publish as much as we want. We don't have to operate in that old-fashioned kind of print model of a logic of exclusion. Um, of course, we need to think then about um, questions concerning peer review, um, particularly what, I mean, when we're talking about journal publishing, for example, are we only going to be publishing traditional journal articles, sort of six to 9,000 words? Are we also publishing conference proceedings? Are we publishing video recordings, music files, and so on? And are these materials all being peer reviewed? So at the Open Library of Humanities, we're having quite vigorous debates of our own with all of our committee members um, you know, about questions to do with uh, peer review. And our position currently is that it's very important launching a new, very large scale project to have rigorous peer review, particularly in the humanities. That has to happen. 
uh, then perhaps subsequent to the launch a few years down the line, we can start experimenting with different forms of review or with post-publication peer review. Okay, I was going to touch upon this idea of the serials crisis, uh, which you, I'm sure you are familiar with, but I think it sort of some of the, the figures are quite shocking and it's worth reminding ourselves. Um, so this graph here then, as you can see, the red line uh, represents the serials expenditure calculated by the American Association of Research Libraries, and that rose 380% uh, from uh, 1988 to 2007. Then we have the green line, which represents the UK Commodities Price Index, uh, which closely mirrors US inflation, and that rose by 80%. So over that period, as you can see, there's a dramatic rise in the cost of scholarly journals being sold back to the libraries, often in these bundles where you have to subscribe to the whole package for the one journal that your staff might edit and you might not be interested in the others. And there's the kind of issue of um, the commercial publishers and, and the role that they play here. Uh, I mean, anecdotally, the reason I chose that image is that, you know, this 380% rise in the cost of cereals over that period is higher than, than the profits being made by oil companies. Uh, so I think we all need to be justifiably very angry about this and, and think productively about what we could do about it. It's worth bearing in mind, then, that these access gaps, as they're called, gaps where universities can't afford to buy the journals that their own staff are editing, publishing in, wanting to teach and so on, um, actually are affecting universities all over the world. And, I mean, Harvard very famously came out and, and said they were going to boycott um, particular Elsevier journals because they couldn't actually afford them. Um, so even the wealthiest institutions do suffer access gaps, and those get dramatically increased um, if you go beyond um, North America and, and Europe and perhaps parts of Australasia as well. So I mentioned then... Um, there's a kind of interesting sort of history here in terms of this crisis of scholarly publishing, um, which has been going on, you know, for sort of 20 years now. Um, it was exacerbated by the dot-com bubble in America uh, in 2000. The university library budgets were hit very hard. Endowments were affected, um, and alongside, you know, the cost rising of the journals. But also there's a slightly longer history from the Second World War onwards, in which um, government funding, particularly in, in the United States, led to more commercialization of scholarship. There were more commercial publishers competing to try and um, gain you know, some of that funding and offering their services. So we, we have, um, over the kind of, you know, late 20th century period, a kind of large-scale uh, commoditization of knowledge, um, which raises various different questions. And finally, um, as you may well know then, this has an effect on monograph publishing. Um, because the journals become so expensive and library budgets increasingly get squeezed in terms of trying to pay for those journal packages in these consortial arrangements, perhaps, um, monograph, there's a lot less money to actually fund monographs. And when you have a consortia of libraries sharing resources, they only need to buy one monograph, perhaps for half a dozen libraries. So it has um, you know, quite a big impact on how we think about funding our monographs as well. So I wanted to talk through some of the lessons for the sciences. This is, I'm literally just going to touch upon a couple of examples that I think are quite salient um, that we can think about in terms of building a kind of humanities project. Um, the first of these, then, is, is this idea of hacker culture. Um, sort of, you can trace it back to its roots in the free and open software movements, particularly around California in the 1960s. There's an increasingly liberal approach towards knowledge on the internet, and there's a kind of gift culture where people are quite happy to be giving away um, their software and, and their ideas to share with one another. There's also a kind of emerging model of sort of peer production where academics are reviewing each other's work and um, publishing each other's work. Um, and, and, and this sort of, in interesting ways, is mapped alongside the development of computers and computer labs as well. So MIT University, for example, in the early 1960s, has greater access to shared computers. Um, the question of peer review and, and what practices we use is, is kind of central to this hacking culture, I think. Um, and I'm going to come on to describe that a little bit more in a moment. The second example, then, um, is, is to do with kind of soft... Um, uh, licenses, sorry, um, general public licenses and so on. 
So we have um, the figure, for example, of, of Richard Stallman, who worked um, in the artificial intelligence lab, hence the sci-fi robot arm. I was very happy to be able to get that image into my talk. He worked at MIT. Um, there was a community there of academics sort of building software, sharing software. Um, the, the term free software didn't actually exist at that time, but they were kind of sharing code for programs with other academics, with other scientists, anybody who was interested. There was quite an open a reciprocal attitude to sharing ideas. Um, so Richard Stallman left MIT in 1984 and went to work for GNU, the GNU project. Um, and his, the, the hacking work that he was doing, he came to call it copyleft. Um, he developed the general public license, the GPL, which has since become the most popular open source software license in use today. So it's a very important moment in terms of open source software. Uh, I was just going to step outside of that for a moment, if I may, because that has some relevance to a project that we're doing at the Open Library of Humanities, if I can find it. This is a more recent um, thing that we've set up. So my, my I, I'm a co-director of the Open Library of Humanities with Martin Eve, um, who's quite a well-known figure in terms of open access um, policy ad advocacy um, and, and academia. And he's, he's coordinating what we're calling the Open Access Toolset Alliance. It, uh, it occurred to us quite recently, actually, when we went to a, quite a big conference at the British Library back in July on open access monographs in humanities and social sciences, that there are lots of different projects developing lots of interesting ideas, particularly on tech and software. And we needed some kind of framework to bring people together and to share ideas and to share code. Um, so the Open Access Toolset Alliance is there. Anybody can kind of join it. You do need a level of technical expertise to join it. Um, they're working with people like the Public Knowledge um, Project, PKP, in Canada. Um, they're working with the people who work at PLOS. They're working with the people at Opal Ge Open Journal Systems and, and many others besides the University of Heidelberg, amongst others. Essentially, what you've got is some of the, the biggest players in open access publishing people from those uh, institutions have come together in their sort of spare time and they are sharing code with one another. And this has a really exciting potential for us, perhaps as academics and librarians, thinking about setting up journals. Uh, for example, Martin's working on a typesetting mechanism that he's been building himself in his spare time. Now, the part of the reason, amongst other reasons, that commercial publishers charge so much for open access publishing is to cover their costs. They're not lean new startups. These are quite unwieldy large organisations who have a lot of staff to pay, and they also have a lot of um, commercial and software costs to cover that they have kind of licensed software that they pay for. Now, what Martin's doing is, is working out his own version of that software for free with other people from some of the best projects in open access and it will be free, and you can all use it. And we can all bring down costs. So anybody who might need an article processing charge because they have to cover certain tech costs, certain digital um, preservation costs, costs around typesetting, formatting, automated uh, footnoting, and all the things that add to editorial labor, all of that will be available because of this um, sort of open software um, license that I mentioned, the GPL license. No one can privatize that. So I think that's incredibly exciting. But I appreciate you need some level of computer knowledge to understand it, perhaps. OK, I'm just going to jump back to where I was. OK, so I talked a little bit about hacker culture, a little bit about the GNU. And I wanted to focus now on archive, because I think archive has some really interesting questions that we can think about in the humanities. So Archive was developed, as you can see, a uh, nice image there, by the physicist Paul Ginsberg in 1991. Uh, it was developed as a means to circulate scientific papers before publication. What I find interesting about this is that it actually predates the internet, that scientists were sharing their work on sort of private email networks between colleagues in a slightly informal professional network and they became aware that lots of people were getting left out of these communications. People weren't at the right institutions. They didn't get to share their work and, and get feedback and so on. So as the internet developed, they decided to set up their own um, repository. It initially focused on what we call preprints. So this is pre-publication versions of articles. And they were in maths, physics, astronomy, um, and computer science. So kind of core STEM subjects. Um, it was originally at Los Alamos Labo uh, Laboratory in California, um, 
and then it subsequently moved to Cornell, who now organised the funding for it. It's not a peer-reviewed system. These are pre-publication articles, and the idea is that, obviously, academics and researchers can get really valuable feedback from leading scholars in their field, and then they take the article forward to publication, and it's a stronger piece of work, and, and it's been circulated beforehand. And they have a much more sort of open attitude, I think, towards sharing unpublished work, perhaps, than we might think we have in the humanities. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about why I think archive is an interesting model and what we might be able to do in the humanities with it. And I was going to rather shamelessly use the example of my own journal. So, oh, disappeared. There we go. So this is a journal um, I set up uh, and then Martin came on board to run it with me. We launched it in June 2012 and it in, in its first volume, in its first year, it published every month four articles, short form articles, around 2,000 words every month. And now in volume two, we've been publishing every two months, purely because it's a lot of work to actually publish every month. I began to realise what have I created for myself. Um, this, is, this is, I mean, I'm very excited about it, but there are other reasons for you to be excited about it, in that it's actually not quite a traditional journal because it's actually run through WordPress. There are other precedents for these short-form academic journals run through WordPress rather than open journal systems type software. WordPress allows all kinds of things, including much more customization of design, which was very important to me. Uh, if I show you the articles, um, you know, you have sort of lots of hyperlinks, you can embed YouTube videos, Images or licensed through Creative Commons licensing. We are Creative Commons licensed. Um, and then down the bottom, although I don't think this article is a good example, but you have a comments function. And we have had some quite lively debates amongst um, academics on the comments function. And I mean, I, I, I set this up, and by and large, it's early career researchers who are publishing with us, but it's also quite a lot of people who have academic positions. So in that sense, it is rigorous. Um, because we are academics, but it isn't peer-reviewed. And I, it, it occurred to me, having done sort of interviews and stuff about open access and people saying, well, humanity scholars don't want to share pre-published material. They're very hesitant about that. That's why we like peer review. We don't want people to read our work when it's not in a finished state. I sort of pointed them back towards conferences and said, we go to conferences all the time and we're presenting working papers to our colleagues whose opinions we value and we're getting feedback from them and we're drawing that feedback into developing our research and then we might go and publish it somewhere else. And that's how I see Alluvium functioning, that these kind of early career researchers are able to get really valuable comments. Sometimes the authors of the books they're talking about are you know, responding through Twitter and social media tie-ins to their articles. Um, so I thought this, this, is, this is sort of doing what Archive has been talking about. This is um, you know, circulating pre-published short-form material. It's not peer-reviewed, but then the editors... You know, we screen everything, and if it's not ready, we'll just keep sending it back until it is ready. And so in a, it's a different form of peer review, perhaps. OK, I'm running out of time a little bit, so I'm going to move on to the OLH. So the Open Library of Humanities. Um, I mean, this, there, I think there is a pressing need to develop new platforms for open access publishing, and, and Martin and I wanted to work on an academic-led project. So this project is run by academics. It is not for profit. We are, we are a company limited by guarantee that is set up with not-for-profit status. Um, and we are working together you know, to build a very large-scale mega-journal project. Um, in terms of uh, you know, how we managed to attract quite a lot of media attention early on, we managed to set up a number of committees. Our steering committee has some sort of very respectable people from the field. Leslie Chan, who was one of the signatories of the Budapest Open Access Statement, as was Peter Suber. Michael Eisen, one of the founders of the Public Library of Science. Kathleen Fitzpatrick is the Scholarly Communications Director at the Modern Languages Association, which is the biggest network for literature and languages. Uh, people from the Wellcome Trust. Cable Green works at the Creative Commons licensing company. I mean, we, we were very happy that we approached all of the mo people, you know, professors at Harvard and Stanford and all the rest of it. We approached the highest level people we could think of, and they pretty much all said yes. They were very excited. They wanted to come on board. So what we developed was um, a consultative kind of model uh, through our committees. 
um, a committee dedicated to library and, and technology, finance, legal issues, IP, early careers, um, internationalisation. We, we're working with people from UNESCO, we're working with people from um, the International Development um, Organisation. You know, we, we have editorial staff um, applying to work with us from across Taiwan, China, Japan. There's funding from the Japanese government that's very interested in this. So there's all kinds of opportunities from South America, North America, Europe. It is, we are trying very hard to make it an international project. Um, okay, in the remaining sort of one minute, what can I say about that? I, <laughs> what can I say about it? it, it I mean, it is massive. It's quite overwhelming in a, in a way how large this project is. Um, but we're moving forwards. We're looking to launch uh, by the end of 2014. We're going for a hard launch. We're going to have um, guest articles commissioned by some of the top professors across the humanities. We're taking an inclusive understanding of humanities. We have colleagues in legal theory, philosophy, um, Assyriology, languages, French literature, I mean, literally across the board, including media and cultural studies, sociology, so some are edging into social science territory as well. Um, I think, I, I mean, I, I could say so much more and I, I don't have time. So perhaps if I open it out to questions, if there's anything I didn't manage to cover, I'd be happy to answer, if not now, maybe later. So thank you. Thank you. And so this time around, Simon has the microphones. And so thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, I'd like to say one thing, which is having made at least half a career out of trying to lead these projects from an administrative side. It's great that we've had two presentations about academics leading these sorts of work and seeing how that approach can be really, really successful. Uh, with that in mind, are there any questions from the audience? Nice one, Kevin. Great. Oh, then we have a question. Thank you. So, so, heavens. So, um, First of all, just to say, you know, just to echo what was just said, that, that you know, the, the academic-led initiatives, the academic, academic-led initiatives in this area are really, really important, and are going to be a central part, in my opinion, of the future future landscape. But, but my question is really a very simple one: is, is what's your business model? Where is mm. the where is yeah. the money coming from that allows that will yeah. allow this project? Thank you. That's a very important part of the talk that got cut <laughs> when I ran out of time. Uh, we don't want article processing charges at all. We're doing absolutely everything we can not to have them, uh, including writing the code ourselves so that we can then work with um, tech companies. We can almost sell them our code so that they sell us back their services and, and we can subsidise all of it. Um, initially, whilst we launch, um, it's a variety of sources, very large philanthropic funders and other sort of pots of money from various different organisations actually around the world. So we're patching together as much money as we can. We have very low costs because we're just a small number of academics who do this in our spare time to start with. So until we start hiring editorial assistants, editorial directors and admin staff, we have very low costs. So that, that's useful. Um, in the long term, though, we're building a business model on a li what we're calling a library partnership subsidy, an LPS, to give it a three-letter acronym. And essentially, um, we're going to be approaching a large number of libraries to, to join a kind of network, and we're going to get very low uh, distributed costs from them. It in the region, we estimate between maybe 200 and 400 pounds per institutional library, depending on the size. And obviously, the more libraries around the world that we can get to join this network, the more everything is subsidised. We might even be running a surplus, uh, sorry, a surplus in which we could then choose, you know, amongst our committees what to do. Do we liberate other content? Do we sort of expand and so on? Um, we are working sort of in tandem with Knowledge Unlatched as another project who's also building a library network and we're working very closely with JISC collections and JISC more broadly. So we're not the only, and the Open Foundation um, we're not the only open access project who are going to libraries trying to set up these relationships. And obviously that is problematic. You don't want lots of different open access projects going cap in hand. The libraries are sort of saying we can't pay everybody, which is why we're trying to organize these networks like the tech, the open access tool set. And if we can coordinate efforts on the library partnership subsidy model front, we can demonstrate to libraries that actually all these different projects, whilst competing with one another in some sense, can work together. 
and for the benefit of everybody. So long term, it will be a, a library uh, subsidy. Yeah, this is a comment rather than a question, I'll be quick. And it's just to echo what I said about Rosary's pre presentation. And I think speaking on behalf, probably, of ESRC and AHRC, seeing these initiatives in the arts and humanities and social sciences is particularly welcome. Thank you.